So uh, ready to start? I'm, I'm going to approach this a little bit differently. Uh, so I, I'm going to look uh, uh, sort of uh, retrospectively back on 2021 and uh, look at look at some of the uh, the challenges, or at least what I saw, thought some of the challenges were from 2021, and uh, how that may affect how we plan for 2022. Uh, I'm also going to address some of the changes. So hopefully you all have good access. I know we have a lot of county agents out there have great access to our scouting guides. Uh, I consider scouting to be the sort of the cornerstone of insect management. Uh, we, we manage diseases and weeds very differently than we manage insects. And so with at least many of our insects, maybe not all, but many of them, uh, we spray in reaction to the pests being out there. I know Dr. Gaucher mentioned that uh, uh, with diseases, it's often a preventative application strategy, but with insects, we, we call it a rescue strategy. So we're going out there, we're scouting, we see if there's enough out there, and if there's enough to justify the spray, uh, then we pull the trigger and would control them. Uh, you know, ID 36 is out. Hopefully uh, all the counties have gotten what they ordered. Uh, I always like looking, uh, well, actually I don't have to look since I, I, I put the information in there, but I think a good place to look, let me put it that way, is that in the beginning we have our uh, Insecticide Resistance Action Committee uh, groupings, and it's a great place to look for new products. And so, for example, you might see things like Altus or Harvanta, PQZ, Safina, or Versus. And these are all relatively new products. Uh, for example, Altus uh, has a very similar product, Savanto Prime, same active ingredient. Savanto Prime is used in the field. Altus is only used in the greenhouse. And so uh, this is a great place to look for, for new products that may be showing up and we're getting some additional tools in the, in the toolbox. So, um, I, I think we're, we're in pretty good shape with insecticides for vegetable crops. I think we have effective insecticides against all common pests. Now, I'm, I'm speaking pretty broadly. Uh, you know, when you get into some organic uh, controls for certain vegetable pests, we, we may not have them uh, uh, all there, but I think particularly for conventional growers, we have a pretty diverse toolbox. Um, but that can be a problem. Uh, and I, I'm just uh, throwing this out there. I mean, we had a serious uh, resistance issue in a field crop last year with alfalfa weevil in alfalfa. And just because you have something that works, uh, we need to make sure that we don't overuse our products. Uh, you know, you have something that works, it's cheap, it's effective, it's easy to use. The danger is we keep using it until it doesn't work. And that, that's how we start to get resistance. Uh, we, we lose that product. And then in the future, we have uh, fewer products that are not as cheap and maybe not as effective. And so uh, what I recommend for uh, producers is that when you're controlling a particular pest problem, have at least three modes of action that you rotate for each new generation of a pest. You know, uh, you, you use a particular product for, uh, that one generation, the next generation, you switch to a different mode of action, a product with a different Iraq group number. And then the generation after that, you use a third mode of action before you go back to that first. And the reason is we can only prevent resistance. Once resistance shows up, uh, we can't fix it. So what were the challenges we had in 2022? Uh, that the, by far, the, we're going to remember 2022 or 2021 uh, due to fall armyworm. Fall armyworm, it was just an epic year for that pest. I'm also continuing to see increased numbers of yellow striped armyworm. Uh, brown marmorated has really started to move into western Kentucky to the point where it's causing problems in uh, various situations in western Kentucky. Uh, and it's attacking a wide variety of vegetable crops and all of our, our fruit crops. So let me go ahead and start with uh, fall armyworm. You know, the, the, 
I, I'm showing this picture here. This is one of those pictures that, you know, as a student, you see in a textbook and it's like, yeah, this happened someplace. That was actually a picture last year from central Kentucky, someone cutting hay. And uh, that was on top of their equipment. I mean, that that's the year it was for fall armyworm. And we saw uh, very high numbers uh, for several generations of the pest in pastures, hay, alfalfa, soybeans, uh, fall wheat, and a number of uh, vegetable crops. And really this was the worst outbreak since the mid seventies. And so, you know, you're looking at the, the worst outbreak in almost 50 years. And uh, uh, it really caught everyone's attention. And uh, to the point uh, last year that particularly for a number of our row crop producers, uh, they couldn't find insecticides. The insecticides weren't, weren't available. They, they were uh, all bought up uh, last year, at least the ones that were most effective against this pest. And th this is a situation, you know, uh, we started to see egg masses everywhere. This is a backyard pool. And you're seeing egg masses all over the pool, all over, you know, porches and things like that, uh, where, where the moths are attracted to lights at night and they lay their eggs. It was just a, a, a very intense year. You know, and the question I get from a lot of people is, you know, why did that happen last year? You know, we get some fall armyworm every year. And I went to a University of Florida fact sheet uh, because this is where the pest overwinters in South Florida, in South Texas. And they say, uh, cool wet springs followed by warm humid weather in overwintering sites favor survival and reproduction of fall armyworm, allowing it to escape suppression by natural enemies. Once dispersal northward begins, natural enemies are left behind. Therefore, although fall armyworm has many natural enemies, few act effectively uh, enough to prevent crop injury. So basically, it built up into very heavy numbers in these overwintering sites and started migrating northward. And there's not as much to slow it down once it gets started. So this is what the fall armyworm looks like if you're not familiar with it. Uh, over there on the bottom right, you see the head and it has that inverted uh, yellow Y on its head. And then on the rear end, on the other side, you see those four brown spots that uh, make a square. And if you see that, uh, you're dealing with fall armyworm. It, it goes through six stages in its life cycle. Uh, and you see they're very small and the, the last couple stages get very large. Also think about the larger they get is related to how much damage they're doing. So the first, you know, three, four, five stages are not causing that much damage. The, the, yeah, they're feeding and they, and they may be doubling in size, but you, you're really not going to notice the damage. It's once they get to that fifth and sixth instar stage, that's when you see them, and that's when they're really starting to defoliate, defoliate the plants. But that's also when they're most resistant to insecticides. And we had some of that problem last year that it, it can get very difficult to control those large larvae. They, they are uh, much less uh, susceptible to insecticidal control. So um, looking back, you know, it is a migratory pest. The first frost in the fall killed them out in Kentucky. So th there are none alive here in Kentucky. What happened last year in Kentucky has no bearing on next year. Uh, we have two strains in the United States. We have the rice strain and the corn strain. And what we had last year was, I, th I think they said it was 90% rice strain. And that's important because the corn strain really is more restrictive just to grasses. Even though rice and corn are both grasses, the rice strain it does feed on rice, but it feeds on a number of other broad leaves, including uh, a number of vegetable crops. So for vegetable growers, that strain can be more damaging. Now, what happened last year? What did we see? Uh, one thing we, we saw is that the consistent catches uh, in last year began in early May. And if you look back to 2020, we didn't see those consistent catches until mid-June. So it showed up here earlier and in much larger numbers than it has in the past. Uh, last year, we did see three full generations. In terms of what it attacks, you know, it's a number of uh, row crops out in the field, uh, but you can also see that it, it does attack some vegetable crops. So tomatoes, peppers, sweet corn, cabbage, 
I had a fall cabbage trial and there were a lot of fall armyworm that were damaging the heads in, in that trial. Uh, there is a natural disease that helps keep it under control. Uh, it's a nuclear polyhedrosis virus and that's what those larvae look like that have been infected. They crawl to the top of the plant and they liquefy and the virus falls over the plant and then other larvae eat that virus and they become infected. It does help, but just like what we saw last year, it's too little, too late to prevent a problem. Uh, there are a few uh, natural enemies that also attack fall armyworm, but control is limited. So uh, what we do recommend is, you know, when there are alerts that go out, scout your crops uh, at least weekly for fall armyworm. It's best to look uh, in the very early morning. Uh, the reason is they hide from the sun. Uh, by 10 o'clock in the morning on a sunny day, they're going to be tunneling down into the ground to get out of the sun. They're going to come up after sunset. Uh, if, if you don't see the larvae, look on the ground for the frass, the waste uh, particles. You can see in that picture there to the right uh, what they look like. They look like little peppercorns on the ground. Also look for those uh, uh, tattered leaves. A lot of times those leaves will be stripped down to the uh, midrib. Uh, when you are scouting, note their numbers, note their size, and their distribution through the field. A lot of times these, these distributions can be spotty through some of our larger fields. There is some insecticide resistance to the pyrethroids, things like uh, Brigade, Warrior, Permethrin, uh, Danitol. Uh, th those pyrethroids do work, but they're much better against the small larvae. The larger larvae are more difficult to control. So the, with pyrethroids, we recommend using them, but when the larvae are a half inch or smaller. Uh, if you, we have larger larvae, we can use uh, products like the diamides, things like Corrigin. Uh, they're very effective, but quite a bit more expensive. Uh, so that, that's, that's a trade-off uh, we have there. So uh, in terms of some other cultural controls, you know, planting early, if possible, it helps with uh, row crops as well as vegetables. Uh, the corollary is when you're targeting fall vegetables, you're more likely to run into problems with the fall armyworm. Uh, pay attention to trap counts from Princeton uh, in the Kentucky Pest News newsletter, uh, particularly during June and July. Uh, you know, in sweet corn, uh, we need to treat for uh, fall armyworm if they're present before they form that frass plug in the whirl. And with any crop, we need to treat before the larvae get very large. So the next pest I wanted to cover was uh, yellow striped armyworm. And I've seen a consistent increase in this pest over the last decade or so. Uh, it's increasing in numbers and in some vegetables, it's becoming the dominant uh, caterpillar pest out there. Uh, I, I really haven't directly addressed it in ID 36. Um, and so I was just going to mention uh, how, to, how to deal with that. It attacks a wide variety of vegetables. And you can see some of them on my list there, you know, asparagus, bean, beet, broccoli, cabbage, cantaloupe, carrot, cauliflower, corn, cucumber, and the list goes on and on. Uh, one thing you do know with this insect, uh, just like the other armyworms, it lays its eggs in clusters uh, in the hundreds, you know, two to 500 eggs together. What that means in the field is when you find one small larva, you might find dozens or hundreds together. And, you know, in, in an area maybe the size of uh, a, a 20 uh, foot diameter circle, uh, you might see all the larvae from that that egg mass. They're primarily uh, foliar feeders. They, they feed on leaves, uh, you know, tomato leaves and, you know, broccoli, cabbage, those, those, those leaves as well. But we find in some crops like peppers and tomatoes, they are fruit feeders as well, as you can see in that, that picture with the peppers and then, you know, tunneling into the side of the tomato down there. Uh, they, uh, they're pretty easy to recognize. You know, you can go by that, that yellow stripe, uh, but you know, depending upon the individuals, sometimes that yellow stripe's not, not as obvious. One thing to note is uh, they have three pairs of legs up near the head. Let me just uh, point that out right here. So they have three pairs of legs up there, and then they have a black spot on the body, but it's past all those legs. 
There's one other insect you might confuse with it, and it's a bead army worm. And you can see here's the, the three pairs of, of legs. Well, I lost my pointer there. And the, the, the spot is over the second pair of legs. And so uh, here's the third pair of legs back here. So it is a little bit different. And, and it's important to notice the diff note the difference between the beet army worm and the fall army worm, just because the beet army worm is going to take very different insecticides than we would use against the uh, yellow striped army worm. So even though yellow striped army worm isn't listed, in ID 36, uh, where you see recommendations for fall armyworm or corn earworm, those are products that would be effective against yellow striped armyworm. And, you know, I was talking about how the eggs are laid together. This is sort of like my Where's Waldo uh, a puzzle of, of seeing the, the uh, yellow striped armyworms on a tomato plant. And you can see, particularly with the small larvae, where you see one, you see them all. You can also see that black spot on the side of the body. So it, it helps you recognize that, that yellow striped armyworm. And note that the yellow stripes are not as obvious with some of these uh, younger larvae. So the next challenge I had from 2021 is the brown marmorated uh, stink bug. Uh, it's increasing in numbers. We've had it in central Kentucky uh, as a serious pest for you know five, six years, and, and it's really been spreading. It, you know, in the Owensboro area and, and, and south of from there, uh, we're starting to see some uh, much higher numbers out there. Uh, it's, it is harder to kill with insecticides, and we can also see higher numbers than we do with some of the other native stink bugs. There aren't many thresholds for treatment with this. Uh, if you do have problems with the brown marmorated stink bug, we need to use some specific insecticides, and I, I list some of them here, things like Brigade, Permethrin, Danitol, Bathroid, Warrior. Uh, those are pyrethroids, you know, some of the neonicotinoids, the Venom, Belay, Actara, uh, even an older product, you know, Orthene. We can still use Orthene on a few vegetables, uh, and, and it, it, it is very good against uh, brown marmorated stink bug. Unfortunately, there's not many vegetables we can use Orthene on. And then lanate. Lanate's a hot product, but it is effective against uh, uh, brown marmorated. Uh, I had a student that's been doing some work with ghost traps the last few years. Uh, these are uh, insecticide impregnated uh, bed netting. Uh, they're draped over six foot tall PVC pipes and baited with a, a pheromone, something that brings in the brown marmorated stink bug. And what happens is they come into that bed netting, they run around on the bed netting for anywhere from you know, two to five minutes before they fly off. And it, it takes about 15 seconds for them to pick up a toxic dose of, of uh, insecticide. And so th this is how attractive some of those different traps are. You know, uh, we monitor brown marmorated with that panel trap. Uh, we can also monitor them with that pyramid trap. Uh, but when, when we look at the numbers coming into the ghost trap, they're, they're even more attractive than some of those other traps. So what we did with the ghost traps is we had some sweet corn fields. We had sweet corn fields that were 100 by 100 feet, so a quarter acre of sweet corn. We had two different treatments. We had uh, fields that had no ghost traps around it, then at least 200 feet away. Uh, most often it was uh, 350 to 400 feet away. We have another field surrounded with ghost traps. And uh, that first year we used four ghost traps around the field. And we found in that first year, uh, we had the ghost traps too close to the field and we actually increased the damage due, due to brown marmorated stink bug. So the next two years, we moved the traps away. We moved the traps 50 feet from the edge of the field and we increased the number of traps to eight. And you can see some of the data with that. If you look over there on that, uh, left graph, the average number of stink bugs per 20 years. Uh, we reduced the numbers on the ears by about 40%. When you look over at the graphs on the right, you see that reduced the number of damaged kernels from uh, stink bug feeding by about 60%. And so, again, we're not having to spray the entire field. Uh, we're just trying to uh, reduce the migration into the fields and that those. Uh, Ghost traps seem to have a pretty good effect there. 
Another challenge that uh, has been increasing, uh, it's been a problem particularly for us on the uh, UK horticulture farm, the South farm has been the harlequin bug. And so this is a, a pest of uh, cruciferous crops, you know, the, the, the coal crops we have there, but, you know, uh, a number of other crops, uh, you know, horseradish and radishes and, and other things that uh, can also build up in high numbers. You see in that lower picture where I have the eggs there, you also see some of the feeding damage from harlequin bug. And so it can really damage some of the crops, particularly for local sales. It's hard to kill, builds up in high numbers, particularly on some of our fall crops. And we have very few uh, organic controls that are effective. So, uh, you know, it is harder to kill. We don't have many thresholds. Uh, for conventional growers, some of our best insecticides will be things like belay, uh, venom, scorpion, uh, and then the pyrethroids, the brigade, permethrin, danitol, bathroid, and warrior. Uh, you know, for a lot of growers, you know, one of the strategies, I know it sounds weird, but, you know, handpicking as long as you can to try and uh, kill off those early uh, colonizers and keep them from laying eggs. And then when their numbers get higher, uh, come in with the insecticides and, and knock them out. Uh, they're going to be easier to kill when they're in the nymphal stage. Last thing I was going to mention uh, was the uh, uh, sweet corn or sweet potatoes. Uh, wireworms are a serious pest. We had a, a, uh, a study last year. We identified some new promising materials that I hope will be registered as new insecticides in the next couple of years. Uh, it, it, uh, wireworms are problematic in, in sweet potatoes in that they have long life cycles. Some of them live in the field uh, two to five years. Uh, and so rotations are important. And also, you know, if you've had uh, wireworm problems, going back to that same plot the next year, you're likely to, likely to have the very same wireworms uh, attacking those, uh, those sweet potatoes. Uh, what I've seen is if you don't manage them properly, we can lose 75% of our crop. Uh, so uh, what has been working well has been soil applied insecticides at planting. And then we use another application about a month later when we hill our sweet potatoes. We, we apply an insecticide uh, right next to the row. And then when we hill the plate, potatoes, that gets incorporated in with the soil. Uh, those are the insecticides we have. Notice Lorsban, which is down at the bottom. Uh, it's crossed off in red because chlorpyrifos, the active ingredient in Lorsban, uh, is being canceled. And it's being canceled. Uh, next Monday is the last day you can spray Lorsban on a food crop, but I, I think next Monday there's no reason to spray it on a food crop in February, but it's disappearing. And so any Lorsban containing product, uh, and these are the lists of the products we have here, uh, not only the, uh, the base products that have just chlorpyrifos, but we have some premixes like cobalt, stallion, and Bolton. Uh, none of these can be used on food and feed crops uh, after uh, next Monday. And if someone were to use it on a food or feed crop, it would be considered adulterated and uh, the, that would have to be destroyed. So let me just, uh, the plant pathologist, Dr. Gaucher, had the, uh, the disease triangle. I have my scouting triangle here. Uh, so uh, we need to scout our vegetable crops weekly. We need to keep written records. Uh, we need to use all preventive controls, uh, get your samples properly identified, and always read and follow label directions.